Welcome to the Afghanistan Project podcast, where we delve into some of the most pressing concerns facing the people of Afghanistan, highlight individuals from around the world and across the political spectrum who have stepped up to render assistance to our Afghan allies and raise the voices of the many people who have been endangered by the Taliban's oppressive rule. I'm Beth Bailey, here with my co-host, Michael Cook. Today, we'll be talking with Martin Smith and Marcella Gaviera about their new PBS Frontline three-part docuseries entitled America and the Taliban, which premieres on April 4th at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central. Marcella has produced over 40 hours of documentaries for Frontline, focusing on the war on terror, the rise of Al-Qaeda, the domestic heroin epidemic, and the Trump administration's crackdown on undocumented immigrants. Included among the almost two dozen broadcast journalism awards she's received are seven Emmys and the George Polk Award for Investigative Journalism. In Martin Smith's more than 40 years of producing and reporting on topics, including the fall of communism, the emergence of Al-Qaeda and the attacks of September 11th, 2001, the subsequent U.S. wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the rise of the Islamic State, he's gained an extensive list of journalism awards, which includes four DuPont Gold Batons, five Peabody Awards, and eight Emmys. Marcella and Martin, we're absolutely honored to hear you talk about this document series and uh, what caused you to produce it and why right now was the time to do that. Thank you for having us. Very happy to be well, here. For the Thanks most for your work. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think when viewers are going to see America and the Taliban, they're, they're going to see this amazing explanation of how we've reached this point in Afghanistan where the country has made a pretty full return to its dismal pre 9-11 state, despite hundreds of thousands of lives lost and about two trillion expended over 20 years. Um, and I think that what Michael and I have seen with a lot of the people that we've talked with about Afghanistan is that it's become a politically divisive topic where people want to heap blame on one political party or another political party. And I think one thing you've done really beautifully in this series is to show that the blame really can be split between every single president and uh, a leader who has touched Afghanistan since we entered the country in 2001. I wondered when you took this on, what made you decide that this was a time to go back to this 20 year period of being in Afghanistan? Um, who do you want to answer that? How about Martin? Let's start with you. Okay. Sure. Um, well, I'm not sure, thinking back, we worked on this for a long time, but we um, had done some other work in Syria, and um, I had some correspondence with a Taliban uh, leader uh, during that period of time, um, uh, inviting us to come to the country, saying, you know, I mean, they were looking for press coverage, and I think they were reaching out, not just to us, but to others. And um, so we were very interested. And then we had a we had a little event up where we live in the in the Catskill Mountains, and we showed uh, around the time that the Taliban were uh, were taking over and Kabul was falling. We showed a, a film that was about ten years old to a group of, of um, neighbors and uh, others, and it got us very excited in returning to Afghanistan. It had always been a place that um, I had wanted to work, um, and so we packed up our bags and went. And it really was a no brainer for us. I mean, I just watching people holding on to those C-130s as they were taking off of Kabul and imagining the human drama that was happening and just the historical context. This is a country that we've covered for 20 years. It was just obviously something we felt so strongly about getting back there and telling the full story. And and we hope to continue telling that story because it's still evolving. But um, th this is a three-part series that's really a culmination of our work over all these decades. And you actually see Marty age on camera <laughs> over the 20 year course. Cause he looks, you know, he was just a kid practically at the beginning of of filming in after 9-11 and, you know, just 20 years went by and there he is still asking the tough questions and trying to understand and talk to people and get to the bottom of things. 
Yeah. You, you know, know what's just, really interesting to. I just want to add a Martin. point, and that is that um, I had done a, a, a report on the African embassy bombings that uh, mm -hmm. happened in 1998. And we went on the air in 1999 with a portrait of um, Osama bin Laden and his uh, sidekick, uh, Ayman al Zawahiri. Uh, in 99, early 99. So we were kind of on the ground floor. So when 9-11 happened, um, we we continued to cover. So it really reaches back further than 20 years. Yeah, sure. Well, I think what this uh, series does a very good job of is just taking, you know, the viewer through that whole 20 year time period, you know, especially for people that just really aren't familiar with uh, what's been going on in Afghanistan for the past 20 years. So I'm curious, Martin, um, you know, what was what was the most recent trip there like compared to your first trip? What are the what were the big takeaways of things that were way different? Well, we went um, for this broadcast. Uh, of course, we used a lot of um, historical material um, from our previous reporting, but we made two uh, extended trips uh, for this broadcast. One was in, I think, November of 2021, not long after um, the fall in August. And then we went back the next spring for another six week trip. Um, of course, the difference is that we were able to be on the ground and move about Afghanistan in a way that during the American presence there, when NATO and American troops were there, um, we were uh, really not uh, safe in most places moving about. But this time, we could hire drivers and travel the length of the country. So we saw a very, um, we, we saw much more of Afghanistan this time than we were able to do um, through, uh, you know, from the back of a Humvee. And that was really surprising to me. I thought that we were going to land and it was going to become one of these situations where um, you were more terrified of the restrictions of being a woman on the ground. Um, but I think the Taliban, at least initially, were very interested in giving us, in some respects, a, a dog and pony show and making sure that we were very safe. So everywhere we went, we were accompanied by uh, a Taliban um, official of sorts that would make sure that we could enter anywhere we went. They had a lot of opinions about what we could film and what we couldn't film, but um, I felt very safe. And that's not something I could say about past trips. Yeah, and how was their demeanor towards you? I'd say, um, <laughs> you know, it varied. I mean, the, the, the foot soldiers kind of, look. some of these guys hadn't really come down out of the mountains for many, many years. Um, and I think they found us something of a, a curiosity, but I, I, I'd say the mid-level officials and on up are, were quite sophisticated and, you know, many of them had been back and forth to Doha. Um, you know, it varied. Um, I'd say that by and large, um, they were willing to sit and ask, answer questions, but we couldn't get every interview that we wanted and we reached uh, as high as we could. Um, uh, and so, I mean, that's true of any documentary you do in Washington, DC, there's officials that are not going to talk to you. The Biden administration certainly didn't want to talk to us about the exodus. Um, so I'd say that their attitude was, um, by and large, they were, you know, pretty high on their victory, especially that first trip. And so they were showing things off. Now, we can talk a little bit further about the splits within the Taliban, and uh, those are uh, severe and concerning. They're, it's not a unified movement. Um, so not all officials at the highest levels see eye to eye on questions like women's education and other things. That's interesting. So I, I noticed you talked to Haji Mali Khan, who's affiliated with the Haqqani Network, and then you've talked to many more traditional Kandahari Taliban. Um, what was it, you you do? One of those members talks about how women uh, in Islam are not, you know, that Islam puts men over women and that women don't need to be uh, educated. Did you see differences then in that? Were there other Taliban members who were more in favor of women being educated? 
there's a great it irony was, right there and that is that that the, the 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 most brutal branch of the taliban the branch that really um introduced and exploited the use of suicide bomb attacks that's the haqqani network on social issues that branch of the taliban is far more progressive than the kandahari faction which is really run by a lot of older mullahs um, out of Kandahar uh, and in government in Kabul. And they are the ones that are trying to apply their very strict uh, interpretation of Islam. The, the founder of the Haqqani Network, Jalal Adin Haqqani, uh, encouraged young girls to have an education into high school. Um, at the same time, he was uh, the most it was the most lethal branch of the Taliban. So, um, you know, stories like this are full of uh, ironies like that. And this one is no exception. You know, I, I really felt a geographic divide in terms of how conservative um, the Taliban were. In the South, as a woman traveling there, I felt, you know, a lot of disdain to, the, to my presence. I were, was asked several times to not be in the room while Martin was inside the room asking questions. They would say, please, you're not allowed. Please step outside. Um, and that didn't happen anywhere but in the South. And the rest of the country um, seemed a lot more progressive. But it was it was quite striking, the difference. And, and it was interesting because some of the Taliban officials that spoke to us from the South they were also the ones that were most um, intransigent about their positions. They absolutely believed that uh, girls should not go to school uh, past, uh, you know, puberty. And they're, um, you know, they, they, they believe that they won and have a right to have the country that they want to have. And that country is of a, a a flavor of Islam that's, you know, going back quite, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very outdated, really. Uh, very few countries in the Middle East uh, would carry such strictures on women, but they want to impose something that's really severe. It's, I love the way that you have both addressed women in this docuseries too. There's an especially beautiful part where you're talking to um, a young activist who talks about how uh, she's not exaggerating at all when she says that if we don't stand up or if we stand up against the Taliban, we'll either get killed or they'll succeed. And then you talk to another young girl from Zabul, I believe, who says that I might be barred from this classroom, but it's just a room. I can, I can get an education in my head and in my heart and in my mind. And I think it's so important to see that Afghan woman, because that is those are the Afghan women I talk to in my life. They are women who have fought so hard to get educated and who are continuing to fight in any way that they can. And sometimes it's very small ways. Sometimes it's just not letting their spirits get trodden upon. And I wondered, did you see lots of other women who had that kind of that fire, that spirit to keep going under the Taliban when you were going through the country? Those two women probably weren't outliers, I would assume. Well, one of those women ha um, has left the country mm -hmm. because of threats against her uh, life. Um, the other one, the girl in, in Zabal, as far as we know, is still there. Um, studying at home, as she says, wanting to be a doctor. It's, um, it's an odd situation. In the West, I think we look at these edicts that come down that say all women must wear full burqa, the blue burqa that covers all uh, the shador that covers their face. Um, and yes, that's posted all over Kabul, even in the, in the, in the center of the country or the um, but not all women obey that, and not all women are punished um, for doing that. So it's very arbitrary. They can be picked off and punished if they're not obeying that rule. But but there's a lot of disobedience. Um, uh, it hasn't reached the level that you see next door in Iran, 
but um, there's a lot of women whose spirit is quite strong and they are uh, continuing to be defiant. Uh, although some of them, like I mentioned, have had to leave the country because they fear for their lives. So it's a mixed bag. And, and again, so the young woman a... who was, oh, go ahead. No, Sorry, that Rizal. it's also, so the divide is between the cities and the countryside. If you go to the countryside, it was, it was actually really hard to speak to any women. I, I don't speak Pashto. And we were traveling with men that uh, speak Pashto, but they're not allowed to speak to the women. So to be able to really get an understanding of what the women are thinking was sometimes difficult. But it was interesting because when you would travel anywhere, eventually a woman would sort of come out of the crowd and seek you out and come tell you her story. And they really do want to tell their story and their struggle. And, you know, there's so many wi widows, widows that have endured, you know, just so much tragedy and lost their their husbands and are, uh, you know, so much war. Um, so they they're not afraid to speak, even if they're behind a, a burqa. Mm -hmm. What was the general feeling of, of the public towards the Taliban? I mean, does it feel like people are just trying to get on with their life or are people still very upset or, or are they accepting of the Taliban? At this you know, point? it was the first question I asked when we rolled in from the airport into downtown Kabul and I was looking around and wondering how people were feeling about uh, the new regime under the Taliban. And I asked my uh, our, um, uh, primary uh, fixer, if you will, uh, translator, and he said, well, it's about 50-50. People are happy the war is over. They are pleased that there are fewer bombs going off. Bombs still go off in Kabul and there's a resistance movement. But by and large, Kabul is a safer place and people like that. Do they like the government? Most of them, uh, either they're not in a position with their work or their lives to care too much. They want to get on with things. But a lot of them really dislike the Taliban and, and they will tell it, tell you that. I mean, <laughs> um, I remember being with the, our driver at one point and, and uh, you know, he just loathes the, the Taliban and, and the fact that they, when he comes, when we come to a, a checkpoint, he has to turn off his radio because he's got music playing and the Taliban will punish him for doing that. So there's a lot of a dislike of the Taliban, but people are happy the war is over. That's that's the best answer I can give on that. And you've shown beautifully why that is. I'm beautifully is probably not the right word for that, but you've shown the, you know, the impacts of the suicide bombs. There's a lot of footage of just if someone's never seen one going off, they're going to see it in this docu series, and you can't help but be moved by that. But then you also see on the other side, the raids and the drone or the aerial strikes where we killed civilians and of course you, no one wants to live in 20 years of that uh and it would weigh very heavily on people uh but i think yeah the, the taliban strict rules you can't get your hair cut a certain way you can't go out you can't get in a taxi cab as a woman without a, a mahram of a male escort all of these things that people were not used to for such a long time and it's such an interesting it's a very interesting thing to see and people will see it in this documentary. And another thing I, I really thought was interesting is the way that you kind of bookend each part of this. And in the beginning, one of the first things that we see in the first episode uh, is a malnutrition ward where there were supposed to be only 180 children in this malnutrition ward, but there were 243. And viewers are going to see the advanced stages of malnutrition that these poor children were in. And uh, that's something that we hear about in the news, but it's not something we often get to see. And then at the very end, the final episode, um, you asked a Taliban leader, you know, when are you going to deal with the other issues? They said that they're working on security right now. And he says, the issue of hunger will be solved in due time. And I just wondered from what you saw when you were going through the country, do the Afghans have time for the Taliban to figure out the hunger crisis? No. And, and, and the Taliban aren't really doing the things that would cost them money because they don't have a lot of money. Um, 
I mean, money is coming into the country and going to the um, non-governmental organizations, the NGOs. But by and large, um, and I mean, I talked, uh, every time I talked to a Taliban leader, I said, why don't you guys get on with doing something positive for the country, like building uh, hospitals, clinics, fixing the roads, doing those kinds of things instead of all these restrictions that you're uh, playing with. It, it, these restrictions struck me as a kind of dark Alice in Wonderland. We're, we're, they're, they're just, um, to an outsider, uh, they they feel very um, silly is too light of a word. I mean, because they, in, I mean, they were stopping men in Kandahar from playing snooker and sitting and drinking tea. And I guess uh, if the French uh, young men were not allowed to sit in cafes before the revolution happened, the revolution might not have happened. And that's what I think the Taliban are afraid of. They don't want young men to get together and talk. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's just so dark, their restrictions and crazy to, to, from an outsider's perspective. The one thing I will say, though, is that on the point of hunger, you know, this isn't unusual. Um, Afghanistan, before the Taliban takeover, if you would have entered a ward, you probably would have seen the same numbers. And the doctors we spoke to said that not much had changed in that respect, you know, uh, hunger and malnutrition, these are constant problems in a country that's so poor. What is sad, as Mar Marty points out, is that, you know, instead of focusing on helping the population now that they're in power, they seem very much determined to just focusing on establishing the kind of Islamic emirate that they want to have. And so their concerns are really about um, imposing that on people versus building a country that works for all. It, we see it too in one of the incidents where you're talking to the Taliban, you can hear one of the Taliban members in the background saying, hey, hold your gun properly, brother, so that you can scare these people. And did you ever feel intimidated or were they attempting to intimidate you or did you run into any kind of dangerous situations when you were filming? I'm so glad you put <laughs> that, that little moment because of course, when it happened, it was in Pashto and uh, I, I know about 10 words <laughs> and I, I didn't catch it. Um, but we found it when we got back in the edit room and um, it, it is, it is uh, kind of, it was kind of surprising to us. I only felt danger. There was a, I guess it was a sun, a, a Friday, which is the day off. Um, and people were gathered in a park um, and children were playing on jungle gyms and little merry-go-rounds <laughs> and people were um, out and about. And for some reason I started talking to people. Uh, I got attacked and I got pushed and I got grabbed. And uh, I, so did my cameraman. And I said, we got to get back to the car. And, but that was the only time, you know, we had a few incidences where they took our camera away and it took us, you know, several hours to negotiate to get the equipment back. Um, I, uh, other than that one time, uh, but it only takes one time, um, did I feel in some danger? What about you, Marcella? As a female, you had talked about earlier, you didn't really have any concerns as a female, but in the South, you well, said they sometimes just wouldn't let you. I, ne I never felt afraid, but I felt insulted. You know, it's like the, the kind of when you're trying to do your job and you're trying to learn and you're asked uh, to... Um, not enter a meeting or you're asked to sit in a place that is uh, less prominent, like hide over there on that corner. You know, those things are, um, you know, complicated as a journalist, but I also feel like I'm not going to take the position of throwing a fit every time this happens because this is the country that I'm in. And if those are that is what is being asked of me. I try to be respectful of the people and their opinions. And I'm not there to impose my views or, you know, be in a crusade about what I think should be right. 
Um, but it, it, it was insulting and it happened quite often. The other thing that I felt was very <laughs> difficult is every time we went into any town, um, sometimes I wouldn't get out of the car because it would attract so much attention to have a Western woman that the cameraman couldn't quite film the scene as naturally as he could. But that meant that I would sit in this car and, you know, 80 little boys would come and like stick their nose to the window and I would be stared at for hours, you know, and, and that just became kind of like, you start to understand what it's like to be Britney Spears, I guess, you know, it's just, God, this is really obnoxious. Um, You know, one of the things we tried, or I, I've always tried hard to do, and so has Marcella, and that is not to go into these countries and apply Western values um, to um, to them and not to ask questions that um, are disapproving and coming from a place of, you know, uh, you're inferior and you should do it this way. But what we do do is ask people about the the views and the criticisms that are coming from their own citizens. The Taliban are a minority. They have seized total control of the country. There are many people that are unhappy. So it was very fair, it seemed to me, to say, well, you've got a lot of women in this country uh, who don't like what you're doing. Rather than saying, you know, you're out of keep, you're out of step with the West. I mean, um, we've got our own problems to deal with, but I think that we can go in and say, um, your people are very unhappy with you for this reason and this reason. And what do you have to say about that? And you do that absolutely every time. It, I think that's one of the great things. You're not going to get an answer from the Taliban if you come at them that way. You're much more likely to get one the other way. But one thing I noticed about the way that they answered you, and this is not surprising to anyone, I think, who's watched the Taliban, is that they dissemble. They don't tell the full truth or they they kind of manipulate it a little bit. I think one instance that was really pretty incredible was when the one Talib said that they never raised the flag at the negotiation office in Doha in 2013. And they absolutely, I mean, there's footage, there's, there's images of that. Um, how did it feel when you're talking to a member of the Taliban and you know that they're not being honest with you? Does that, is that frustrating as a journalist or Actually, it gives me an edge if I can if I can have them say something that's patently not true and show that to be the case, then um, that's um, a good piece of reporting. Um, How do they yeah. react then in that case when you're able to show them that they're well, not? They can continue to dissemble. Um, I mean, all you have to do is watch uh, cable news networks to see uh, examples of dissembling on this side of uh, the planet. <laughs> so it's natural and they're not going to tell you everything. And, it, 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 and they are, they're engaged in their own internal struggle. And so the, the views, I mean, I remember having a conversation and we tried to include this in the documentary, but for a lot of reasons, it didn't make it. Um, and I was asking a Taliban spokesperson about music. And I said, I mean, what is the harm of music? And he gave me this answer that was like, well, it's, it's the devil's work, you know, and, um, and I said, yeah, yeah, maybe some of it might be <laughs> if you want to think of it that way. But what about Mozart? He says, no, that's no good. We can't we can't listen to Mozart. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the absurdity of some of this stuff, um, you know, men's pants, <laughs> legs have to be a certain, you know, length above the ankle. And it's um, but again, they have every right uh, and they have a legitimacy, as we point out in the film in the country. Now they are a minority, but they have a certain uh, legitimacy as Afghans that we didn't have as Americans coming in. And we lost our sense of mission um, uh, along the way, um, unfortunately. Uh, but they, it, they have a certain legitimacy. It's Go interesting ahead. how they really Knew, I mean, they thought long and hard about the country they wanted when they gained power. And so now that they have arrived in power, uh, they're determined to carry this out and they don't want anybody to have an opinion about it. So 
you know, off the record when you'd sit with officials and talk to them about um, their thoughts on things, you know, they would say, it is our right. We won. You have no right to have an opinion about the country that we have. This is what we fought for. And it, it, it was very striking to hear them say that. There are hum universal human rights, and, and I don't want my answer to be construed that I don't um, hold to a kind of universal um, standard on human rights. But we do have to judge the Taliban um, where we can on their own terms. So um, we're, we're very careful about that. It is their country. They're not the majority of the country. They're a minority party. They're not about to run elections. Um, I don't know how long they're going to last. Uh, I can't, you know, make predictions about that really, but I, I have some doubts. Hey, Martin, when, when you're sitting across from these guys, does it feel like you're being lied to or does it feel like they truly believe what they're saying? Uh, most of the time they believe what they're saying. There were instances. I mean, one that was uh, sort of interesting was a guy telling me that uh, uh, Osama bin Laden was not responsible for 9-11. And, you know, once in a while as a journalist, you just pull out the, oh, come on, you know, um, <laughs> that is well established. You know it. I know it. And he persisted in saying, well, there's no evidence. There was never a trial. And, and you persist. And at one point he said, OK, 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 he did it. <laughs> and it was it was kind of odd for him to admit that. Um, it, it, it's a, it only so, took so like an hour to, to get that answer. <laughs> Yeah, we had it was a squeezing. <laughs> yeah, I had to squeeze it on that. But but you know it's it's uh, they have their talking points, and uh, they hold to them. On the other hand, they they well, it depends who you're talking to. Some are more um, uh, dyed in the wool uh, Taliban, and others. Uh, you know this guy. Um, Zaif, Mullah Zaif, who was one of the founders of the Taliban, and we spend a lot of time talking to him, especially, I think, in the first hour. Uh, he has since uh, left the Taliban for reasons that are not clear to me. I wasn't able to finish that interview because he got tired and just said, that's enough. I'm not going to talk anymore. Um, and we had gone for two hours at that point. Um, but, you know, um, he's... Uh, he, he strikes me as a pretty straight shooter. But again, he was one of those who said Osama bin Laden wasn't, you know, there's no evidence that he did 9-11. I said he admitted it. I mean, there's video where he talks about it. Yeah. And, and what does it feel like to sit across from these guys? I mean, we, we've had um, some senior officials from the Taliban reach out to us wanting to come on the podcast, and we haven't had them on yet. But I'm just curious, I mean, is it intimidating or like, are, do you ever just sit there and be like, man, what am I doing here? No, it didn't feel intimidating. But I've interviewed a lot of uh, characters in my short <laughs> career. Um, so it didn't. Uh, I don't know, Marcella, did you ever feel that anybody? You know, the, the, the thing that's so sometimes the way they stare at you and sort of with like utter dislike, I felt that a bit when you interviewed uh, Haji Malihan, who's part of the Haqqani network, and he just sort of gave you such a steely look. And, but it never felt scary. What, what, but you do sit there and you think that's the man that, kidnapped you know david road and that's the guy that you know killed 42 people at that you know with that bomb and and it is sort of like you you can't in your own mind sort of grasp the amount of harm that they've done in 20 years and just sort of come to the moment where you're staring them in the eye and realize that they too have um something to tell us about the way we behaved and the mistakes that we made as Americans. And, you know, and there were many. The difference is that when they took a suicide a bomb into a, uh, as I pointed out to Zaif, into a marketplace, they know they're going to kill civilians. Our, our attacks 
are not excusable uh, by any measure, but they were uh, mistakes. They were acts. I mean, it wasn't the intent of the Americans to bomb the Doctors Without Borders hospital. It was sloppy. It was, uh, you know, a horrible, horrible event. Um, there obviously needs to be some tightening up in the way in which they target uh, homes and facilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think but, that's I'm intimidated by them. I don't, and I don't think that that's bragging. They just, um, I mean, Haji Mali Khan looked at me with, like Marcella said, really hard. Um, but I don't know. It, it, yeah. So. You know, the, the does, only uh, time... does U.S. intelligence ever give you guys a call after you talk to these guys, wondering, <laughs> wondering what you know, or have you not gotten that call yet? <laughs> we, we, we're. They keep asking us, "When's this going to air? When's this going to air?" <laughs> Um, to, to the point of annoyance, because we delayed the broadcast because we were initially slated to do a two hour. Then we got a two and a half hour. And now we have three hours. And so it delayed the broadcast. And they were all like, well, what's what, what are you doing? Well, why is this taking so long? I'm and I imagine there will be some people who will feel certain kinds of ways about this because you've been very um you haven't shied away from showing the points where we went wrong where our leaders made mistakes not just at the presidential level but um you know some miscommunications for instance when um some media reported that petraeus had said that children were lying about the source of their injuries after um a was it a bombing attack that allegedly happened and and he talks you show the footage in this series of him saying no i never i never said that and you know those are difficult moments for anybody to look back on as we're examining right now this first draft of what happened in afghanistan because that's really what this is this is the first draft of what did we do and why did you think it's important to confront these issues now instead of say 10 years from now after it's had time to simmer or things have had time to maybe hopefully improve in Afghanistan? Well, I don't know if I'll be around 10 years from now, <laughs> Beth. So this was the time to do it. Um, and as Marcella said, we, you know, when we saw those airplanes taking off and people falling to their deaths, I mean, and this momentous defeat, um, of the United States in Afghanistan. I'm, you know, I remember the Vietnam era very clearly. And to my mind, this was another case where we wandered into a war for a reason to, to kill Osama bin Laden and degrade Al Qaeda. Uh, but along the way, we, we lost our, we lost our way. Um, and um, we set up a lot of expectations and then we bungled the, the ending um, and the treaty or the peace deal, if you will. Um, so there's just a lot of mistakes diplomatically, militarily, all the way along. And it just seemed, knowing all that, that we should get in there and report it. We did write a letter to General Petraeus and warned him that he will face some tough scrutiny. On the other hand, he said some of the most uh, uh, cogent uh, pieces of analysis in the whole broadcast, I thought. Oh, he's an excellent thinker. And, you know, you can't, this was such a complicated problem set, as you say. I mean, trying to do counterinsurgency, which is a brilliant idea in theory, but trying to do counterinsurgency light in Afghanistan with 21,000 troops when 300 to 400,000 were needed, you know, how can you expect to, or you bring it up all the time, the willpower. Did we have the willpower or a lot of well, people you I, interview bring it up, I should I say. I think one of the things that we really <clears throat> wanted to look at was all the, I mean, this war dragged on for so long and we could have stopped it a lot earlier. And in the meantime, so many lives were lost. So much money was spent. And I think there's so many lessons here that, you know, we could have committee after committee, but if we continue to enter these wars with a belief that we can arrive in a country that we don't understand with a topography that exists and that we can impose democratic values 
on a country that has not been democratic in that respect. It, it's just, you know, the hubris of it is pretty astounding. And, and I think that, and I, my hope is that people that watch the three hours will come away and next time, you know, we sign up all these young men to go, you know, fight wars and risk their lives and die for them that we think hard about what we're doing and why. I mean, let's let's be honest. Um, there were incremental gains, and women um, made great progress, especially in the big cities. Um, men uh, were were able to uh, take jobs that they would never be able to take now as reporters. Um, you know, the, I mean, how uh, there's so much unemployment. It's 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 really tragic. Um, but. You know, unless you're going to stay there and create a colony, um, I think it was very evident uh, fairly early on that uh, we weren't going to stay there forever. We were going to slowly withdraw and that when we withdrew, it would fall to the Taliban. And you cannot, in my view, this was an unwinnable war. As long as Pakistan next door was able to give um money and uh, advice, and most importantly of all, sanctuary to the Taliban, and the Taliban were not going to be defeated. Um, we were unwilling to go, uh, we, we tried, but we couldn't really twist uh, the arms of the Pakistanis um, who are our ally hard enough to get them to let go. The, the, the Pakistanis saw it very clearly. The Americans are going to leave, let's make friends with the Taliban, uh, because after the Americans leave, we want these guys uh, to be on our side. They got problems managing the Taliban now, but still, they didn't want to turn their backs on their uh, on the Taliban. I guess in so talking about how the twenty years of war clearly they were not effective. We did have incremental gains, but most of them have been completely shot in the last. 18 or so months. You've given all this amazing evidence what, of, of how that didn't work, but we've returned to a pre-9-11 state, which is obviously very disconcerting. There's ISK, there's Al-Qaeda, there are even more terror groups now that are operating out of Afghanistan, according to numerous different groups who are documenting that. What do you think should be the uh, you know, should we maintain an interest and attempt to work with the Taliban to counteract that if they're working with those groups? What do you see as the future? Or do you think that we'll get pulled into something else just like we did in Afghanistan again? I mean, do you have any thoughts about what that looks like or should? That is the um, $64,000 question as to how we should manage this situation now. Um it's a very difficult one. You, 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 we're not going to gain anything by going back in there with force. Um, I do think as much as the withdrawal was bungled, uh, Biden has um, some reason uh, to think that he can over the horizon attack uh, threats. Um, but I mean, I think it, it, it's very tricky how you encourage those branches of the Taliban uh, that whose values you approve of or, or you're more in favor of um, without getting, you know, um, stuck to the tar baby, if you will. I mean, so I, I think with a, I think we should stay engaged like we do around the world, but we have to get rid of this idea that we can uh, make the world safe for democracy, as President Wilson liked to say. But you um, know, I I, I a, think, and I, I'm glad that the two of you spend so much time on this. What what really just upsets me on a daily basis is looking at my phone. I mean, somehow my phone number has been handed out to lots of people who write me out of the blue and just say, I've heard you're a journalist, uh, that perhaps you can help me get out. This is my story. 
and the the horrors that are on my phone of people that show me pictures of their husband that's been tortured of their children that have been taken and this is on a daily basis and i think this you know country has to figure out what to do about all these people that are left behind that are fearing for their lives and Perhaps it's not our responsibility as a nation to take care of that aftermath, but I certainly feel a moral responsibility, and I don't know what to do for any of them. We have to recognize yeah. the limits of our ability to affect these situations, and that's the hard lesson that the United States post-World War I and World War II has had a hard time grappling with. Um, only in in Korea, do we have a permanent presence that holds the the line? Um, and we weren't going to do that in Afghanistan. So what mm -hmm. what do you do? Yeah, and and Marcel, we hear from those people all the time too. I mean, we get emails and texts almost daily from people that are still stuck there and you know trying to get out. And you know, it really feels like the White House is just trying to sweep everything under the rug at this point. So I'm curious what your guys' experience was um, dealing with the White House and just trying to get comment from them uh, on your series. I think you know that in the program, as Kabul is falling, we tried to talk. I mean, we made many phone calls starting many, many months ago, over a year ago, trying to line They had up 18 with, months and, to like go on television. They ignored every single phone call. I mean, we had so many letters and meetings and, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to take responsibility <clears throat> for what happened or answer questions. And that's unacceptable because people from every administration answered our questions except for the Biden administration. And we pay their salaries. I mean, the public has a right to hear from them. Frontline um, is a responsible um, venue. Uh, we tried very hard. We had Zoom meetings with White House uh, staff. And frankly, after a while, they just started ghosting us and we couldn't even get a response to an email. So um, other than Halil Zad, who continued from Trump into the Biden administration, no one wanted to um, come forward. I think that's the real tragedy of all of this. I, I was in the intelligence community from about 2010 to 2013. And when I left, that was when we were engaging with the Taliban. And I knew when we leave, it's going to be ugly. And I didn't know what it would be like. I think any administration was going to struggle with a withdrawal. I think that the most unfortunate thing is that it hasn't been dealt with. We haven't heard from the Biden administration. And then when you have people like we always share a story at the end of each podcast um, from an Afghan. And today our um, the story comes from a priority one applicant to the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Those people are still sitting in Pakistan and Afghanistan. They were promised that they would have their refugee admissions packets basically handled within 12 to 18 months of the processing beginning. Their processing has not even begun yet. That 12 to 18 months hasn't even started yet. We have special immigrant visa applicants who are still stuck. They're being evacuated at a very slow rate and we're watching them getting killed by the Taliban. I watch journalists, Afghan journalists, who every week show more terrible photos. And to me, that's the real it's tragic that they're not answering those questions. The public deserves to have answers to all of these questions, but the trauma continues and we're not doing what we need to do for those people that we made promises to. And it's, I hope okay. that you can get answers at some point to all of these questions from the Biden administration, because it is very important. Frankly, I yeah, think I mean, if you look at Ukraine helped uh, take the spotlight off of Afghanistan. I'm sorry, Michael. Yeah. No, I was just going to add, you know, if you look at the the numbers published by No One Left Behind, they have documented over 240 cases of SIV applicants that have been killed in Afghanistan just waiting for their comm approval. So, you know, it's a, it's a massive issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very disconcerting to know that people who shed blood beside us or volunteered to do that are still at risk today. Um, I'm wondering, just to close out, you know, what do you think that the Taliban is going to, how do you think their reaction is going to be to this series? Do you have any 
thoughts about that? Have you heard from Taliban leaders at all? Yeah, one of them has tweeted uh, the trailer that Fraulein has circulated. Uh, and with a little tag, it's infuriating to me, actually. He says, uh, uh, Frontline is going to do a story about uh, something about how the Taliban won the war, which is true, um, but it's, you know, it's a bit more complicated than that. I, I the think, nuance has yeah. been lost there. Yeah. I think that they're, they're going to like the series in the sense that we... Uh, you know, sit down Afghan officials and give them the time to answer our questions. And we um, show them, you know, show their their narrative in, in a substantial three hour series. But, you know, in the end, the, the series concludes that they are, you know, cunning, complicated, and pretty, um, you know, yes. pretty good at lying. And, <laughs> and you know, if you watch the film, I don't think they come across as, you know, anything but that, you know, very complicated uh, leaders. And, and I don't think it'll change what they're doing over there. But they do want to be seen as world players and and i think in some you know respects a lot of the media that interviews them um doesn't take the time to listen to them and i think marty as a correspondent really did mm -hmm. and guys i just have one more question <laughs> for you and that's you know for the average american that's going to watch this series this week what do you want their takeaway to be from it well, I, I would say that it should be a sober realization that we uh, wandered into a war, lost our way, um, and that we set up expectations and then pulled out. And that there is a moral obligation to help those who helped us, but we abandoned those people. Um, and. And I, I think the lesson I'd like people to, to learn is that we set up those expectations by going in there uh, with our idealism, um, with our billions of dollars, um, and that we have to in the future be careful about wandering into these um, quagmires, which, which it is. And I, I feel for the Afghans, but I'm not sure that... Um, for the incremental gains that were made that, that we really accomplished very much at all. I really appreciate both of you uh, talking about this really important series. And I wanna close out, as I mentioned before, we always close out our episodes um, by giving voice to the people of Afghanistan about the ordeals that they've undergone in almost two decades of war. And now obviously in this very tumultuous return to Taliban rule. Um, today, we're sharing the story of an Afghan man whom we're calling Zaidi, and Zaidi has a priority one referral to the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, but he is unable to travel to Pakistan to initiate processing, and he's devastated by the U.S. government's evacuation response, which has, in his estimation, been inadequate. I will mention, too, that even if Zaidi were able to get to Pakistan, he would be like almost every P1 or P2 applicant that speaks to me, and he would be stuck there because processing has not commenced, and he would have to endure massively increased costs of living, as well as um, if he had children, they wouldn't be able to go to school because they'd be refugees. And as soon as his visa expired, he would be subjected to the Pakistani military or the Pakistani police attempting to get him out of the country, which they are doing increasingly now. Um, so this is Zaidi's story in his own words. Dear Beth and Michael, please, I am attaching my story, which occurred during my life in Afghanistan, and I am still stuck in Afghanistan. I obtained my P1 ARR case number from the State Department through the Embassy of the United States on the 13th of December in Kabul. I must travel to a third country to initiate my P1 processing, which will take many months in Islamabad, Pakistan. I am unable to afford my trip. You may know Pakistan is not safe and it is quite expensive there. 
I have a credible fear of persecution, which includes, but is not limited to capture, torture, and death by the Taliban or other enemy forces or criminal em entities that is based upon my membership in a particular social group. Specifically, me, my status being an Afghanistan national with the United States, with a, an affiliation with the United States government. <clears throat> The government of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is unable to and or unwilling to provide me with protection from the persecution to which I have a credible fear thereof, and that there is no place within Afghanistan from which I can obtain safety or security from Taliban persecution. What was most upsetting was rather the lack of assistance I received from the U.S. government and the U.S. coalition non-governmental organizations on evacuations after a long wait, despite their pledge to assist me. I made several attempts to escape, but I could not get safely out of an uncertain situation under the new government. The crisis in Ukraine has made every aspect of evacuation more challenging or slower for the U.S. government and NGOs. That is Zaidi's story, and we're really grateful to him that he wanted to share that with our listeners. Um, for any other Afghans who want us to share their story on the podcast, please send in a letter with as many details as you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, if you need to remain anonymous, you can tell us that in your email and you can send that to our show address, which is the Afghanistan Project Podcast at gmail.com. Um, Marcella and Martin, thank you for taking the time to talk to us about what spurred the creation of this docuseries and the important takeaways that you're hoping to leave viewers. Um, it really means a lot to have you here tonight. Thank you, Beth and Michael, and thank you for the work you do very much it's really wonderful to meet you at last and i hope everybody tunes in we air april 4th april 11th and april 25th yes at 10 9 10 p.m eastern 9 p.m central correct you can find that on frontline we will make sure to include the links in the show notes so that you guys can find it easily and tune in you will not want to miss it it's really especially if you feel like Afghanistan is a massively complicated problem and you can't quite put your head around it. This is a very thorough and yet easy to watch and understand and feel something as you're watching it series. So please do tune in. And uh, we want to thank all our listeners for sharing their time and supporting the people of Afghanistan. Tasha Kaur, as always, and we hope to see you again soon. Let me just point out one last thing, and that is that once the broadcast is aired, it will be available for free on Frontline's website, www.frontline.org. You can stream it there for free uh, for And if you happen forever. to be geo-blocked for any reason, you know, um, there's always Amazon Prime, and we also air there. Awesome. Everybody watch. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Take care.